Um, well, Shabbat Shalom and welcome, Rabbi Address. How y'all doing? I hope everybody's fine and healthy and well. And um, and for those of you out really west, uh, just stay cool because um, we have one of those rare, rare, nice days in New southern New Jersey. You know, it's about 82 and sunny and no humidity, so nobody really knows what to do with it. Um, but anyway, it's nice to see all of you. I hope you're well. Um, we're going to be tackling the beginning of the book of Numbers. That's the portion assigned for this week. Some things that we want to go over with you, pick your brain, because on the surface, this just seemed like, a, you know, just an ordinary blow off Torah portion, kind of like dry, a lot of numbers, a lot of census and stuff like that. Oh, hello. Somebody... Okay, I, that's there's something, something was going on with Michael's connection. It's okay now. Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Super. Um, the signals get sometimes messed up, you know, from New Jersey out to the West. So um, we'll begin with the blessing and then we're going to meet each other. If you have a Torah portion, if you have a Torah commentary, numbers, we're going to begin the fourth book of the Torah today. Numbers chapter one, Numbers chapter one. But for first, if you'll join me, Baruch Atad and I, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Kedushan Mitzvah Tov V'Tivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah. Um, and we're gonna see how this Torah portion speaks to us. Okay, so the context, we're in the book of Numbers, the fourth book. Um, we finished last week the book of Leviticus, which was predominantly law. We return now to that sense of narrative uh, and go back into the narrative around the wilderness, uh, which is going to make up the predominant collection of verses in the book of Numbers uh, before we uh, complete and we hit the book of Deuteronomy. So if you go to Numbers 1, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, which is where we're going to start. We may never get past it, but that's where we're going to start. Uh, let me get... And the Torah begins, or the, the, the parasha begins, God's dabers speaks to Moses. Bamidbar Sinai, and right away, for those of you who remember your Hebrew commentaries, commentators like to play around, as you know, with words and make up things. So the root, Vayidaber spoke, um, and Midbar, in very many ways, it has the same root, Dalad Beit Resh, Dabar, which usually means to speak. The Midbar, which is the name of the of the book in Hebrew, is the wilderness. So God speaks to Moses in the wilderness from the tent, from the Ahel Moed, at this particular period of time. Does anybody know the, um, and for those of you who have a, a biblical commentary, uh, you'll probably, it's, it's stuck there in the footnotes probably. This particular Torah portion by uh, uh, Bamidbar appears when every year? Anybody want to remember? Has it a guess? Just before Shavuot? Right, just before bingo, just before Shavuos, or depending on which neighborhood you were raised, Shavuot or Shavuos if you're from the old neighborhood. What's the what's the significance here? What's the significance is it and it is it is traditionally a, the portion that appears before the holiday, the festival of Shavuot, which begins uh, at Shavuot uh, this year is Wednesday, so it begins Tuesday night. It's a pilgrimage festival. It's a pilgrimage festival. It's the first harvest. And in fact, at the back end of this Torah portion, there's the uh, command to offer uh, uh, the first 
of everything to who? The guy upstairs. The, well, depends I mean, on- My great-grandparents called him the boss upstairs. Yeah, yeah, it depends if you live in a condo, the guy upstairs may be somebody you don't want to even deal with. Um, <laughs> so um, you, you give the first fruits of the harvest this Tuesday night, Wednesday, uh, you bring it to the temple, it's the first harvest. Remember, you're planting. When did you plant? Because remember, all these holidays, the three pilgrimage festivals, have nothing to do with history. They are agricultural holidays. So when did you plant? What was the last big holiday? Come on, you guys know this. With the funny food? I mean, Passover began. Passover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, this is, this is real easy. Passover, that you plant. Remember the, 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 all the springtime symbolism on the, on the Seder plate. Passover, Shavuot, Sukkot, we were agricultural at the beginning, before we went to college. So the historical stuff was locked on later. The historical stuff is later on. So you plant in the in, in end of March, beginning of April, and here we are with the first harvest. And the first of everything is devoted to God. What about if you have the firstborn son? What happens to that? Some of you may have actually participated in this ritual. Firstborn son. Isn't it called Pidion Haben? Yeah, the Pidion Haben. Anybody, anybody ever participated in a Pidion Haben? Anybody? I watched it happen with somebody what? that I knew. I watched it happen with somebody that I knew. Yeah, so you did. So, okay. So the Pidion Haben, we did this with my kid. Uh, you redeem from the priesthood your firstborn male child. Now they may do it with a woman now that uh, they're, they're uh, with the feminist revolution. And traditionally, and there are actually minted coins from Israel, shekel coins, that you, there's a ceremony um, and you redeem the child from the priesthood. Um, I would venture to say that the majority of American Jews right now, suburban American Jews, A, have never heard of this uh, and thus have never even participated in it. It, it, it is not a, a overwhelmingly big festival or ceremony, but it is based upon this idea of that which comes first is, de is de first fruits, first harvest um, is devoted to God. And thus we redeem that person back. So, God speaks to Moses in the wilderness, Bamidbar, and he's going to lay out a whole bunch of things. So I want you to play with, I want you to play with this idea of the wilderness. Why is God giving the Torah on Tuesday night and Wednesday, which is the historical tradition? If you are a traditional Jew, you celebrate on Shavuot the revelation at Mount Sinai. If you reject the concept of divine revelation, you celebrate the concept of Torah, okay? So in liberal Judaism, non-Orthodox Judaism, which by definition from its inception in the 1800s rejected divine revelation, we celebrate the concept of the giving of the, of, of the Torah itself. This is why confirmation, for those of you who went through confirmation, is usually done on Shavuot, which is symbolizing, yes, I accept the, 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 the Torah. It's another story for another time. But why the wilderness? How come the, 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 this is, we didn't wait until we had a temple and a house for God and brought everybody together and said, okay, God has now revealed the Torah, which is, by the way, what happened in the book of Deuteronomy, but we won't get to that until, until July. Why the wilderness? Just play with it. What, what's symbolic of the wilderness? Just first things that come to your mind. I don't know if it was in the reform Chumash, but maybe it was in the conservative uh, commentary volume. The wilderness symbolizes, um, not symbolizes, it, it was given the wilderness so that anyone who wanted access right, to absolutely. Torah would have access okay. to it. Yeah. Um, there's a midrash that all of this is based upon, which basically says, um, 
I'll quote because I didn't memorize this. Uh, why was the Torah given in the wilderness? Because the desert is open and accessible to all mankind, as it is said, quoting in the book of Isaiah, let everyone who is thirsty come for water, water being the words of Torah. This is a traditional symbol. Why was the Torah not given in the promised land so that no one tribe would have preferred claim? Moreover, as the Torah came from a land neither sown nor tilled, so Torah scholars should live without sowing or tilling, that is, they should be relieved of the yoke of earning a living, which is a really uh, popular phrase amongst rabbinic students. Um, so the, to the symbolism of the Torah being given in the wilderness is so that it is accessible to everybody and thus the concept that, that so it, it, it it's open and the idea if it was given in the in, in once they were settled one tribe you know versus another although as you know torah the 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 uh, sacrificial cult is empowered by the aaronite priesthood so there is a tribe that's specifically devoted uh, uh to this now once so the wilderness is where this action starts. Now get off the literal text. Get off the literal text and play with this idea of the wilderness, the midbar. And well, how would they know when they would ever have a temple? How would they know if they're in the wilderness? Um, that's their temple. You know, there might not be a time. Uh, yes. Some of them were living when they would get to a place where there would be a temple. And that's why in the diagrams and stuff you have, and we'll get to this in a minute, um, the construction of how the group moved after the census, the Mishkan was in the middle, the tabernacle. But we'll get to that in a minute. So, Leona, just hold that thought, okay? Leona, there's a person who just sat down next to you. I don't know whether you know him or not. <laughs> that's my husband, the guy on no, the uh, John. Okay, I just want to make sure because, you know, it could be like a subway. People just sit down and, you know. <laughs> no, I know him. <laughs> thank God. I mean, it's a lot easier. Um, play with this idea of the wilderness. Get off the text. Because as we've talked about before, Torah language is also metaphorical language. Torah language is metaphorical language. Play with this idea of the wilderness now in our lives. Some would say we are in a wilderness. Are we in a spiritual wilderness? What do we do in the wilderness if we are searching for something? Is the wilderness, which I would suggest to you, the central metaphor for Judaism? Because, and I, because everything of substance in Torah where does it happen with the exception of the book of Genesis? It happens in Bamidbar. It happens in the wilderness. Is the wilderness a metaphor for each one of our own lives that we search? We're trying to get to the pro a promised land, which we'll never get to. We struggle. <laughs> We rebel, there's good, there's bad, there are enemies. Anybody wanna comment on that? Because I, I really do believe the wilderness, this, this is the central metaphor for Judaism. Anybody, once, twice? There is something, there's something in the reform siddur that I, my shul uses called Mishkan Tefillah. Yeah, Mishkan Tefillah. It's the prayer book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's one of my favorite siddurim. I use it at home. There's something in the alternative liturgy where it says, may I find you in the quiet or we find you in our quietness. So in the wilderness, kind of a more quiet place than a bustling metropolis. Well, that's that's a favorite image. Uh, yes, it's in the prayer book. It's a favorite image. Where do many religious leaders go to find inspiration, transition, transformation? They go to they, nature. They go to nature. 
go into the wilderness. Moses is in the wilderness. Jesus is in the wilderness. Muhammad would have been in the wilderness also. Yes. What's a favorite literary motif to find inspiration? We go away. We absent ourselves. The idea of, of, of removing oneself, I need to get away to find myself. <laughs> I'm an author. I'm going to go to the, you know, all these are, I mean, in, in movies and literature, I'll go get a cabin and I'll, I'll go write my great American novel. This idea of running away, not or being absenting from the daily life in order to find, but it begs the question, or do I need to get away in order to find God or find that sense of the sacred? Do I need to go into a wilderness, psychic, spiritual wilderness, there are many who, it's a very, very big uh, series of commentaries right now amongst many, many rabbis, that we are living in a spiritual wilderness, that we have lost our way, that we're in a society where you can do anything to anybody at any time and don't worry about it. It's okay. That there's no rooted, there's no there there, there's no spiritual foundation. We are in that sense of a spiritual wilderness. another metaphor and then how do you how do you combat that wilderness so the I wilderness, mean, the, wilderness could be, the wilderness could be in a highly populated area so is it possible is it possible to be in your own spiritual wilderness surrounded by thousands and thousands of people yes absolutely so this is why i love one of my three or four favorite words in torah comes right back from the beginning of genesis called livado which means in the text in genesis alone but it really i sense has a sense it's john right Yes. Of, of an existential aloneness. I would submit to you that we have now so many people who are living in this wilderness of self. Mm -hmm. They are surrounded by family. They could be surrounded by friends. But if you actually encounter them, I'm alone. I, I feel totally alone. I feel totally cut off. Part of this is post pandemic. But I want you to, that's why I wanted to raise this idea of what this metaphor really means about the wilderness and the search, the search for the sacred within the wilderness of our own soul. Because I'll submit to you that I think one of the reasons why this Torah portion speaks to so many once you get off the literalness of the text is that there are a lot of people who are living in a spiritual wilderness. Comments, any questions, comments? Once, twice, three times? Uh, uh, John, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're fine, you're fine. Okay, so um, first you're talking about the wilderness as refu refuge and then the the second uh, concept of wilderness which makes more to me uh, seems to be just the the opposite. So, are are you talking about opposites, or is it all the same wilderness? I I feel like I'm in the wilderness, pretty much in the wilderness a lot of the time. All right. Um, well, well, to unpack that, John. What what what? Why do you? What do you mean? Uh. I feel like I'm not at home. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the world is not the world, and I am not quite right. Um, so, yeah, the, the 
vacations that I took to, say, the Yosemite National Park. And it was beautiful, but that's that that's the that's the refuge and the the wilderness of life. I think is that's how I experience wilderness. When I'm hearing a uh, place of refuge or place that you want to escape from, like right. right. Uh, that's, that's the best I can do. No, no, no. I, no, I thank you for sharing that. It's a very, very personal and very, very meaningful because I think you're not alone. I think you're not alone. I think there's a lot of people who feel like that. Um, in the work that we do with, with in, in my work in Jewish Sacred Aging, we do, in, we do encounter people who feel that. We just did two webinars uh, in June and May or April and May, whatever. This is June, right? Okay, so it's April and May. I have lost track of time. Um, we did these two webinars, which are actually just put on the website uh, because we recorded them. It just talked about what are, you, what, are you, what are you feeling like as you get older? What are the things that really are of your concern? What are the things that keep you up at night? What are you worried about? What are you rejoicing about? And um every once in a while people would and the, people shared some very intimate things it's you know saying you know that i'm at the stage of my life where um what what does it mean you know what does it mean it has a lot to do with loss and how we handle loss but what does it mean because there is a certain sense of being, you know, in a, in a sense of spiritual or psychic wilderness, which is why this image of the book of numbers in the beginning of this Torah portion, I think is so powerful because I think it's a feeling if you really are honest with it, that a lot of us share a lot of times. Anyway, um, Susanna, do you have your, the, your hand up or? Oops, you're muted. You, you're muted. Thank you. Um, one of our comrades was talking about the Mishkan, the current prayer book, and I am such a fossil. I I still have the 1950 something or 1960 something, nine, 1975 Gates of Prayer. Oh, the Gates of Blue. Yeah. yeah, the old blue book. I love that. And there's a wonderful verse in there uh, that at first sounds like the opposite of the wilderness, but maybe not. Maybe it's actually the same in a deeper sense. It talks about the sorrow of being caught in the prison of self. Yeah. Right. And the um, the wilderness, physically, geographically, we think of large spaces, you know, big scenery. But your remarks in the last few minutes, Rabbi, about the internal wilderness, the inner sense of having no emotional or spiritual landmarks. It's not just physical geography. It, you can be in a very um, self-contained prison where if you're the only one that matters, in a way, you're without landmarks also. So Correct. I think part of what this message is, is uh, about the sense of community or connection as an integral part of identity, whether it's personal identity or family identity or religious identity. If you go too far in or too far beyond, you get lost. Well, I think you're I, I, you're channeling just about every piece of contemporary literature dealing with as we get older, 
about the necessity of keeping social connections, communities, being involved with other people, joining a faith community, joining, you know, they have done studies now that if you join a synagogue, you live longer. And the, and the, which to me, if I was running a synagogue anymore, I would have put this a big billboard right on every highway, join Temple Whoopi, live longer, you know, because the sense of, and this is also true and after the, the pandemic, the sense of isolation, which is still there, then manifests itself as you're telling, as you're as you're correctly reporting, in a in an isolation of the self psychically. And I know people. I probably there's twelve people on this call. I'm sure some of you also know people who basically shut, who have isolated themselves for a variety of reasons. Sometimes illness does this. Okay, um, variety of reasons, but the psychic wilderness, which is why I wanted to raise this with you, um, because some of you live near deserts. You know, some of you literally could drive an hour or less and and be in the wilderness, um, and yet feel very very much connected to friends, family, community, etc. And some of you may. Some people could drive into that wilderness and just be overwhelmed by their own psychic um, isolation. Which is another reason why there's been this spike in mental health issues, especially amongst people who get older. Um, which is not the conversation, but certainly is is absolutely present. So, Susanna, you, you're right, the, the psychic wilderness um, I believe is really very, very real and present. And I think actually gets more challenging as we get older. Because as we get older, we see all those circles of connections beginning to shrink. And that scares the out of us. Because it's very real. It's very, very real. Christo, Vakasha. I'm kind of glad that she brought up Gates of Prayer. I still have a few volumes of Gates of Prayer in my home. Yeah, my, soul still uses, my soul still uses Gates of Repentance on the High Holidays. And I've been, known, I've been known to even use the original Union Prayer Book on occasion. So don't be surprised if you see me with one of those, too. No, actually, you, I have my Union Prayer Book right over there next to my Gates of Blue. And as we cook, because if you remember those days, they had a get. We used to. We kiddingly called it because every they had the home prayer book, the memorial prayer book, the prayer book for assemblies, and each one had a different color. So we were just giving the gates of gray, which was the small little compact prayer book. But yeah. every once in a while, I'll do a program with the gates of the union prayer book. And there are still people when you hold the, the union prayer book up and read from it, they go, oh, it's like seeing a friend they haven't seen in 55, 60 years, which is literally true. A few reform schools still use that prayer book. Yeah, well, the the classical, um, yeah. I love looking through it on occasion just to compare what what liturgy was like then versus kind of how it's different now and in between. Well, if you yeah. if you really want to do a study, maybe it's another adult education class, but you can study the way Israel was portrayed as in the reform movement. From the beginnings of it, the prayer books that they use to what is happening now, and it tells you a lot about some of the internal dichotomies and divisions that are taking place within liberal Judaism vis-a-vis -vis the state of Israel in light of the war. But that's an, I'll throw that at, that's another adult education class for you. Sherry, did you have your hand? I, it's your hands in a tree over there. Yeah, sorry. Um, a, so I just wondered when this was written, do you think that the people, um, the Jewish people were in sort of a place of spiritual wilderness at that time? No. Themselves, a, no. Okay. This is the book of Numbers. Well, I mean, I'm <laughs> sure that people were. But the, once you get off the divine revelation of, you know, all this was given at a particular point at Mount Sinai or whatever. And the book of Numbers is, you know, a compilation. It's predominantly priestly. Priest, the, the, the number of texts uh, are priestly in their orientation 
the Torah is a compilation in, in its if you step back, a vindication of the right of the priesthood to control things. So the Aaronite priesthood, the the it is is predominant. And you see this in the later books. Once you get off the narrative book of Genesis, which is in essence our ability to say, this is how we got here. It's it's the creation. So this is how we got here. And once you get to the book of Exodus, which says, okay, now we know how we got here. Now we're going to tell the story of how we became a people and the relationship to this God. And then Leviticus, the law, which is the Aaronite priesthood writ large, because it's the laws of how to govern society. And, X, and Numbers is a collection of narratives identifying the rule of the priesthood and the primacy of God, because you have these revolutions. You have the, the couple of weeks, you'll get the Koreanic revolution and the rebellions against Moses. And they're all punishable in the same way. If you dare violate my commandment, I'll kill you. It, it's very, the Torah God is very, very simple. You do it my way or I kill you. It's very simple. It's a very simple theology. And then Deuteronomy, which we'll get to in the summertime, is the summary of everything that's happened, again, from a priestly context. So, I mean, this is why Torah study and the documents and, and where it comes from is very, very important to understanding how we grew as a people. And, and, and But the priesthood, can, you know, when the Babylonian exile ended and the Jews returned from the Babylonian exile, it was a theocracy, it was the priesthood. They were owned by Babylonia, then the Greeks, then the Romans. We know there was a little bit of independence under the Maccabean revolution that was that took place under a power vacuum between the Greeks, the Ptolemaics and the Seleucidians. And then the Hasmonean dynasty corrupted itself and brought in the Romans in the second century. But all this is another class for another time. Um, it's pretty fascinating, by the way. It's, and, it's, and it also helps understand how everything evolved um, uh, in some, even in some of the later books uh, of, of, of the Bible. But numbers, numbers is this sort of like bridge book that reinforces the, the, the rule of the priesthood and the, and the power of, of God. Um, and it takes place, obviously, in, in the mythology of the wilderness. And I say the mythology because, you know, it, it, this is the most powerful metaphor that we have in Judaism is the wilderness, the wilderness experience. Everything goes back to that almost everything we do historically textually is formed in the Torah. Susanna, you have your hands up. Thank you. Um, this might be a question for a, for a different day, but your remark about the earliest God, do it my way or I'll kill you. The Torah God. Yeah, yeah the Torah God. Um, and now we have a more complex vision of God who also forgives, who also loves, who also inspires and beckons. Is God actually changing or is God all so all powerful that as we and our species mature, our understanding of the nuances of the ambiguities enlarges and we simply are seeing more of what's behind the curtain and if that's the case now in this wilderness which god are we envisioning the old mighty i'll lead you god or a God that is more, um, what, harder to reach, that is within us, between us, around us. And your God is what? Where are you? I, I am in relation to a God with a higher vision who beckons us to find the best within us and to connect with others who are okay. doing their best. 
but that, you know, that's as abstract as anything else. And it's not, it's not stern. It's not certain. It doesn't have answers. I wish, I wish there were. No, no. A lot, you know, in moments of crisis, we all wish we could, you know, dial it up and you get the answer. But we don't, sadly, we don't work that way. I mean, so I, I, I really wish sometimes we did. Although you can interpret it like, yeah, follow the commandments. That's your answer. And that's through the Torah, by the way. You know, you have to set before you the blessing and the curse, life and death, good and evil. These are the ways that you should act. Leviticus 19. Go read Leviticus 19. These are the things you have to do. You know, these are the things you do. If you do these, everything's going to be all right, which, of course, is not true. Because you have a lot of people who are really, really good people and do and live a really good life. And they get dealt really lousy cards, which is the, uh, um, you know, why do bad things happen to good people book? Which And the answer is because sometimes stuff happens. But the answer to your question, your first question is, yes, it's a conversation for another day, but this is a long conversation. Two, it's a conversation that every synagogue has to have. Most don't because it scares the bejesus out of people. <laughs> uh, and I'm, uh, 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 but I encourage more and more congregations to actually have significant serious conversations about theology and their own theology three theology changes proof text of that is exodus 3 the burning bush mythology where moses asked for a name to take to pharaoh and the answer is eh, yeah i share eh, yeah which is now in the new translations not translated susanna in the old translations is i will be what i will be which is sort of like it is that it is, which means nothing. But what that really means, Susanna, is that Judaism, this is one of the geniuses of our tradition, says to you, you are now given the freedom. You don't teach this enough. You are, you are given the freedom, and it's okay, to evolve your own definition of what that word G-O-D means. And don't be, cons don't, be a f don't be surprised that it changes over your lifetime. So the kid who is bar mitzvah now, today, right now, in some synagogues all over the world, some boy or girl is going to be bar bat mitzvah, and they're going to walk off the bima probably with a nice 13-year-old concept of God. Translate fast forward 20 30 40 50 years think of your own life when stuff happens do you want to reach into your pocket and you pull out a 13 year old concept of god most people throw it away as they should but here you have the the invitation on the part of the jewish tradition to constantly evolve and create your own definition of where it is for you that's a, a, a we don't teach that enough and it is a genius gift of Judaism so I would encourage you to think about you know a conversation or a series of conversations about what does that word mean to you now that I'm not 13 and then I've had to deal with stuff stuff and how did I deal with that and what's at the center? And, and hold that because we have two more hands up and we're going to run out of time. But there's one or two other images that I wanted to do in this Torah portion. I didn't think we'd get off verse one. Yashim, por favor. Yes. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so um, when I think of wilderness, uh, I also think of my times and it's it says a lot about my faith i guess because it wavers it's not always there and uh when i think of wilderness i think of like my own disconnect from divine reassurance and divine warmth which i perceive in my body and sort of like not just in my body but it's not just the mind it's like a spiritual kind of 
belonging or a wholeness and and it's very reassuring and it's it's oh, yeah. a connection it's like when you go into the water and you're about to swim you join water with your whole body and even though there's skin my insides feel the water and that's right. sort of the closest um analogy of how i feel i'm connected to god's and god's divine essence which i feel and 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 I feel that connection a lot when I'm actually in the natural wilderness, you know, when there's, but so wilderness for me has these kinds of connotations, but mostly it's that disconnect when I don't feel that sense of being, yeah, just presence. But you, know? you feel it, but you feel it, right? In yeah. those moments, let's, of holistic interconnection. Yes, that's what I aim for. So it's like I I believe in 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 chemistry, not the chemistry that I barely made it through in high school by bribing a teacher. I think oh that was algebra. Um, <laughs> but do you ever meet someone and you and you have this instant connection? there is this almost chemical reaction within mm -hmm. you and sometimes you grow up to marry those people sometimes you become very very good friends with them or sometimes you just are in a business you just say i can work with this there's something about we connect we use the same words that's a spiritual moment mm -hmm. and and we find that also in nature. It's fascinating. So many people, so many people say, I find that when I go into nature, when I go into the mountains, when I, when I look at the ocean, when I surrounded by, you know, this overwhelming beauty. Um, yeah, Donna, we do need, that's the whole theology of relationships that I believe in. We, we are totally interconnected with everybody because we are as uh, in uh, Tuesdays with Maury, and Mitch Album wrote, we are all part of nature. We feel that because we are no different than the animals or anything else. We are part of nature. We think, we think we're something greater, but we're not. We are all part of this organism, this life affirming organism that has a place and a time on the planet. And our challenge is to try to figure out what the hell are we doing with this? And a lot of times we don't figure it out until it's too late. So this is why this wilderness concept, because we're all trying to get to the promised land, which we never get to. Or to paraphrase another piece of Torah from the 1960s in a probably the gray Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young album, which I still have downstairs. Um, we're all trying to get back to the garden, which is this other great image of, of bliss and perfection, the Garden of Eden, which also doesn't exist except in our idealized world. But this is, this is part of the human condition, Yashim. It's you, you, this attempt to, and you know it, you, you can't prove it, you know it when you feel it. You know it when you're standing and, and, and you're overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed. I remember standing on the top of a glacier by myself in, in 25, 30 years ago in, in Alaska. And being totally, and you felt there was something spiritual about the moment. And it was like, Wow, like it was an oh wow moment. You, and you said, well, where does it come from? I don't know where, it just is, I know it. I know it when you're with a friend, you see, or that's why I think the chemistry. Who else? Um, Christo, did you have your hand up? My, my disagreement with you is, is always gonna be very respectful because you're the rabbi, I'm the lay leader. No, don't play that game. So just oh no, I am a lay leader. So believe don't me. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Just go for it, man. 
You said the 13-year-old concept of God should be thrown away. Respectfully, no, sir. Should the 13-year-old concept of God instead be kept and maybe stored in the archives of life? Okay. Because a 13-year-old writing something for his bar mitzvah, yeah. he can look back on that and say, oh, here's how I understood it then, just like how the, the Reform Haftar commentary was improved, and now it's in the Reform Torah volume, improved and better. So okay. I think that the 13-year-old concept should be saved, but kept in the what I'm calling the archives of life to refer back to when you've learned more. Cool. I think that's a great concept and a great image, and I probably will steal it. But I Help will give you credit. Now I will give you credit. Help yourself to it. No, no, no. I, no, I really believe that you should be. That's why I love teaching Torah study because you always learn. You always learn. And but that's just right. Torah. That's before you get to Hof Torah later on. You're, 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 you're absolutely. Dead. We are. Look, we are all the product of all the choices that we have made throughout of our lives. You know, who, who we are now. You can't, you know, we may regret certain things or we may look back and say, well, I believe that when I was a kid and now I don't believe that anymore, but I remember what I did believe and it was cool. Okay. And all of us have done that and said, boy, I don't believe I did that when I was 20. So you're right, and the 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 word that you use, I like the eye kind of an archive. It's it's really a cool image. That's why I have the original Union Prayer Book. I've got the Gates of series. I keep them next to Mishkan. I have the old Hertz Kumash. I keep it next to the Ed Time. No, it's it. By the way, another adult. I keep giving you adult education ideas. So I I don't know whether you do that or not, but. The study of the prayer book itself, the structure of the prayer book, how the prayer book evolved, the contents of the prayer book. So we don't teach that enough. It's fascinating uh, in how those prayers, they, they didn't just haphazardly get put together by somebody. Uh, there's purpose and, and structure. Um, if you ever decide to offer that, I promise to listen. No, well, it's up to you guys. Listen, you know, listen I'm... I'm <laughs> What do I know? I don't know anything. I'm just in New Jersey. What do we know? Um, well, you're the rabbi. I'm a lay leader, so. No, no. We are all <laughs> well, trust me, we are all on this journey together. Yeah. Um, each in our own wilderness, but we're all on it together. One of the things that you alluded to, and that I wanted to come back to, um, there's two other things, real fast, because we're down, it's almost, it's 10 of 1. The very, the ne very next thing after this, the introductory <coughs> verse is that there's a command to take a census. Okay, so first of all, what, what's the reason for the census? The real new wilderness is surrounded by perhaps... Supposedly people. it's of fighting men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's for the military. They're raising, they want to find out who's able to fight. So, of course, the, uh, the, the tradition plays around with numbers. Here's a great Midrash. This is why this stuff is really, really cool. And um, this is, um, Christo, if you have the Eitz Chaim in front of you, it's, it's on page 770. Okay. So this is from a commentary on the census from Levi of Berdachev, one of the all-time, one of the all-stars. He's on the all-star team of Hasidic commentators. He connects the final total of 603,550 Israelites, the dude actually counted them, uh, to a tradition that there are 600,550 letters in the Torah. This is pretty cool. Just as the absence of one letter will render a Torah scroll invalid, so the loss of even one Jew prevents Israel from fulfilling its divine mission. It's a very lovely little midrash.
how do you relate it to now? Everyone counts. Everyone counts somehow. Everyone counts. How do you relate it to the headlines of every single day? Because the beauty of Torah study is this stuff is not ancient, okay? As you just talked about for the last almost hour, it's very relatable to the stuff that we're living every single day. So in this war in, with Gaza, this horrible thing that, that is literally slicing the American Jewish community in, in half. How would you, if you were teaching this text this morning, how would you relate Lev, Lev of Berdachev's interpretation of the numbers to today? How would you do that? Anybody want to hazard a guess? You're all looking at me with this, what the heck is he talking about look? First thing that comes in. My understanding, even in Reform Judaism, if, if one of our Torah scrolls has a flaw in it, yeah, you can't use we it. repair it as soon as possible. We don't it's put it off. It's Pasul. Yeah, we repair it as soon as possible. But what does it have to do with Levi Berdachev's interpretation of even the loss of one Jew prevents Israel from fulfilling its divine mission? What are we living through right now? What do you see plastered on medallions that people are wearing around their necks in synagogues? Get them all home. Bring them home. Bring them home. I guarantee you somebody will preach this sermon today. The news this morning that I saw when I got up that the IDF captured four, brought, uh, liberated four hostages evidently yesterday. Bring them home. So here you have a Hasidic text based upon this Torah portion and the number of people that the census reinterpreted of saying, look, every so everybody is so precious that we need everybody to fulfill the divine command. And if we lose even one, it may inhibit our ability to do that. It's a great midrash, great little midrash for today, for all time. Last thing I want to raise with you because we're, we are, as usual, running out of time. The census portrays, and in the, if you have a biblical commentary, a plout or the Etz Chaim or something else, a biblical text, They've actually tried to construct how the marching, and he had all the tribes, north, south, east, and west, and what's at the center of the community? What's at the center of all the people assembled in the tribes? The Mishkan. The Mishkan, the, 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 the portable, movable, portable place where God would come and dwell fire etc etc cloud now play with that image why the center where is god in the center is god at this is this sense of the sacred whatever it may be whatever that may be susanna's vision whatever's vision of what that sense of the sacred is is it at your center is it at the center of your existence or something else is the sense of the sacred at the center of the country is the center it what centers you push comes to shove what is right now at this stage in your life at your core at your core of existence that gives you stability a sense of security 
that sense of purpose? What is it? What is it? Anybody want to hazard a guess for yourself? Not, you know, what you think the teacher may hear, but for yourself. What is it? Is it your family? Is it politics? Is it tikkun olam? Is it health? Is it safety? Yeah, Leona. I think it's at this age, I'm 79, um, is just live every day as best we can. Uh, don't look back. We don't get any do-overs. So don't make this the center of your life. I shoulda, coulda, woulda. That's a bad just place. Do everything that, that you can to be a good person now and enjoy life and enjoy every day as it comes and don't worry so much tell john that every day don't worry so much no that this is why i wanted to this is why the symbolism of this tall portion is so powerful because that core and you and you and and you just i was talking about these webinars that we did you'd be amazed at how many people get to this stage of our lives because i'm also 79 and I'm struggling with this every single day. Is it true, true? Have said, you know, I was, and I was just talking to a guy at another class, Steve, who's 81. And in class, he said, yeah, when I turned 80, I kind of realized I had to restructure my entire life. And he, he says, exa oh, Leon, exactly what you were saying. I realized that, you know, Netanyahu doesn't really care what I say. But what's important to me now is my family, my grandchildren, living as best I can, making those choices that sanctify life, and understanding, to parallel Christo, the archives in my life, and understanding that and trying to live as best I can. Whether that is out, is that God? Or is it really a sense of coming to a sense of understanding of, of who we are, each one of us? Whoops, Chuck, there's somebody coming at you. Um, this is why this 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 visual image because around this image and it, it, all these tribes all these people but at this and they don't move until the mishkan moves all right so we'll leave you i'll leave you with this think about this shabbat what is it your core what is it the core of your existence what motivates you what brings you joy what focuses your daily activity is it something beyond our own self unless you think this is just made up next time you pray the amida prayer in services elohei avraham elohei ishak v'yahei yakov sarah rebecca wow. rachel and leah yeah. the first prayer in the amida it's lador vador it's legacy. It's what do I want to leave? How do I want to live so that I can bring honor and respect, not only to myself, but to all the people who will come after me. And when they think of Leona, what do they want to remember? Legacy. I wish you a wonderful Shabbat. It's we're bang on time. I think I'm supposed to come back to you in the beginning of July. Yes. I think, uh, Great. Second, <laughs> second, I think the second Shabbat of July after uh, the fourth, whatever that day is. Anyway, stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. Stay Thank cool you. for those of you out there in, in the heat dome. And um, just stay well. Talk Yashikoa. to you. Yashikoa, Rabbi. Shabbat Thank shalom. You.